the example of the Free Aceh movement in Indonesia and its response to the tsunami and earthquake on Boxing Day 2004 is a really interesting example of how such an unanticipated but possible event can shape individual incentives, group incentives, and state incentives to actually decrease the risk of, of conflict and increase the chance of settlement. And the videos that we watch for this segment, if you didn't see them, I'll put the links in the description below, uh, are an example of how these kind of natural disasters that we think about big picture can have really concrete interests on the ground for both rebel leaders as well as um, citizens in these particular areas. And I thought it was uh, a case that we can look at and to see parallels and differences with other um, cases of conflict that we've seen so far in the semester. So you can see here um, the, the, the extent of the tsunami waves emanating out from the epicenter of the earthquake and how really close the epicenter was to um, Aceh. Uh, a province uh, in Indonesia, in the far northwest uh, part of Sumatra, and how this long-running uh, conflict and the people there were just were completely devastated um, the, uh, after this natural disaster. It was pretty similar in size and scale to the disaster, the earthquake in in Japan in two thousand eleven, uh, off of. Um, uh, off the coast that ended up damaging the nuclear reactor in Fukushima. It triggered a tsunami on Boxing Day. It killed almost a quarter of a million people. 180, 168,000 of those people died uh, in Indonesia, almost all of them in Aceh, because was, as you saw from the previous photo, they were pretty much right there. And the capital city was on that side of the island and was um, incredibly hard hit. It was the deadliest tsunami in recorded history, and it had widespread political effects. From the, you can see a lot of videos uh, of the tsunami. This is a, a still of um, the tide going out when people were out in the beach in, in Thailand before it came in and washed away. Um, both Thai citizens as well as international tourists. Some of those international tourists um, their experiences were um, were made into a movie, of course, with uh, Ewan McGregor, Ewan McGregor, and Naomi Watts. I haven't actually seen the movie. I think that's a goal over summer to see if I can find it on on Netflix. But these kind of dramas are suitable for Hollywood, um, but they have um, more broad based damage in localized um, populations that didn't get the same amount of coverage as white tourists in tourist resorts in Thailand. This is a photo of uh, Banda in Aceh and uh, the water that basically went washed over the entire uh, town. You can see the size and scale of the damage in the satellite photos before and after the disaster. You see basically all the, the settled areas are pretty much washed away from west to east. Um, Aceh, I don't know how many of you have had to learn about uh, this part of Indonesia for any of your other classes. It's roughly 2% of the Indian, Indonesian population. It's quite small, a little less than 5 million people. Um, also, roughly a small percent of the Indonesian GDP. Um, quite mountainous, connecting back to the Furon and Leighton uh, um, articles and the focus on how mountainous terrain can make it harder for states to be able to control. And natural gas, there's a dependence on natural resources there. Natural gas was uh, discovered about 50 years ago and is crucial to the Achenese economy, as well as how much the locals feel like the, the revenues, the rents from uh, natural, res uh, natural resources of actually uh, landing in, in that province. So a bit about the free Ache movement. Um, just kind of a brief time, uh, timeline. Um, there was a, a bit about it in the video, but it's hard to kind of, Vox hasn't done an explainer on the, the Free Aceh movement. Uh, a couple of 
relevant points I think is important. One, Indonesia declared independence from the Netherlands uh, after um, World War II, as with a lot of other countries. In 1949, the Dutch East Indies ceased to exist and became the Federal Republic of Indonesia, led by uh, Sukarno, long-serving leader. Uh, a couple of years later, um, the one of the Achenese uh, leaders, Daud Burade, uh, Bur I'm going to mispronounce the name, uh, declares Aceh independence from Indonesia. There was a rebellion to try to get uh, autonomy from the new government, uh, similar to a lot of the cases. Uh, and the Fear and Layton, they include a, a, an explanation for why new states are more subject to rebellion, because the state government is less solidified. People aren't used to working within the system, and they're more likely to use uh, violence. After six years of conflict with the rebels, the, several, the central government gave Aceh a uh, special territory status, gave it um, a high degree of autonomy in religious, educational, and cultural matters, uh, similar to um, uh, East Timor on the, on the other side of the country, um, which is a solution you see a lot of governments have, and they try to settle some of the grievances while still keeping the part of the country within the larger whole of the country. Um, this lasted until 76, uh, in which there was a Free Ache movement, uh, was a, a rebel group established for uh, forming an independent Islamic state. There were three main waves of conflict, similar su to Sudan and the South Sudanese uh, rebel movement against the uh, Khartoum. A GAM 1 was from 76 to 79, that is an initial movement, relatively small number of fighters, estimated between 25 and 200. As with all of these rebel groups, they want to overstate their relative strength, um, and the government wants to downplay their relative strength, so actual numbers of supporters is often hard to come by. That's why e people usually focus on casualties, people who are killed in skirmishes. Um, and there's a little over a hundred people in those three years that, that died. Second one was right around the end of the Cold War, 89 to 91, um, when Suharto was the, was the leader. Larger group and subsequently more deaths, uh, estimated between 2,000 and 10,000, roughly the same number of years of that conflict episode. The last one from 99 to 2005, more members between 15 and, and 27,000. And you can see deaths uh, over those years were less intense than during the end of the Cold War, um, but still a pretty regularly regular number of deaths that would qualify for the higher level of civil war um, designation according to the data sets that we use in this data. As a side note, this, is the, this table was from Michael Ross, who we saw in the Natural Resource Week is quite influential in looking at natural resources and conflict. He was looking at um, as at the GAM as a, a rebel group to see whether these kind of natural resource curse arguments uh, apply to um, to this particular case, as well as using the Collier and Hoffler um, greed model. So using it, uh, using that model, he looked at the different major factors of that model. Um, relatively poor, low level of economic development compared to the rest of Indonesia. It was quite mountainous, as I said before, harder for the state to control. It was relatively um, ethnically homogenous, um, which in, in the literature we've seen that those, there's a nonlinear relationship between ethnic um, diversity and conflict. Relatively ethnically homogenous and diverse countries are less likely to fight than those that have some clear fracture between let's say 60-40 to 80-10, um, to right? Rwanda would be a case in this once you have um, 17 to 20% Tutsi and about 80% Hutus. Um, the the uh, uh, Achenese do have a diaspora. There's a history of conflict, as I said before, dating back to the 1970s, highly dependent on natural resources, which is consistent with the arguments for the negative effect of natural resources through various mechanisms that Humphreys and others talked about. Uh, and there was also reforms in Indonesia after um, the protests and the rising costs led to uh, Suharto stepping down um, in towards the end of 98, I believe. That led to democratic reforms in, um, 
in Jakarta. After the uh, Boxing Day disaster in December of 2004, there was um, a renewed effort to bring both sides to the table, and there was actually a peace agreement signed in Finland in August of the next year. So within a, a year after the end of the uh, tsunami, there was a, a peace agreement in 2005, and there's been um, there's been ongoing discussions and difficulties within the state, but basically there have been uh, no, uh, uh, last time I checked, um, recurrence of conflict in that particular area. Um, at 2001, similar kind of move towards more uh, con uh, autonomy from Jakarta as a way to try to, to deal with those grievances. After the peace agreement, um, uh, Aceh was allowed to institute Sharia law in the territory, um, consistent with the uh, people who live their uh, religious beliefs. Um, poverty has rec uh, recuperated uh, with a, within uh, two years of the pre-tsunami levels. So Those pretty amazing efforts to try to rebuild uh, society and people's uh, living standards. The former um, uh, political wing of the rebel group became a political party, um, Party Ache. Um, in the next election, after the peace agreement in 2009, they won 47% uh, percent of the vote, which is a plurality in local level elections, um, which is uh, quite, uh, quite dramatic and gave them political influence in the local uh, state government. As what often happens with a lot of these groups, um, there were schisms, 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 uh, within, uh, within the party and within a couple of years of forming, there was a creation of a spin-off party um, in 2011, and in the election after 2009 and 2014, the election support of the main party, Ache, was down uh, over 10% from the previous election to 35%, in part because of the support that had been siphoned off by the, Sprinter, uh, by the Splinter Party. There have been, um, uh, to the extent to which Ache gets in the international news. It's often because of the kind of implementation of Sharia law or because of the natural resources. Um, various uh, the punish, uh, whipping has been a, a punishment since the institution of Sharia law um, for a couple cuddling in public. That was last year. Um, homosexuality was also punished with caning in a couple of uh, different examples. The wildness of the area doesn't get talked about that much, but because of the mountainous terrain, saw a recent example of uh, elephants destroying uh, um, houses wandering into uh, developed areas uh, last year as well. Moving forward to this year, there have been efforts to try to increase outreach and create soft power and try to increase tourism to the area, like in other parts of Indonesia that's become a large part of the of the. Um, the act, uh, economic activity in this area. Before the um, pandemic, there was a ultra marathon, a 250 kilometer race planned for August of this year. Uh, they, uh, they host the image to, to don't be scared uh, to come to Aceh. Unfortunately, the race was postponed because of the pandemic. So I have time to get training to be able to run 250 kilometers. Um, yeah, there's a lot of incredible races in a lot of far-flung uh, parts of the world. There's a marathon in, from Everest Base Camp uh, down, to, down to Namche. There's races across the Sahel, across the desert, the Marathon de Sabla. There's a lot of really epic races in far-flung places. I think this was an effort to bring Aceh into uh, a more visible uh, position in developed countries to try to increase international tourism. Unfortunately, it hasn't uh, come off yet. Other thing that's more directly related to the class, there was a national level election in 2019, uh, the latest one, 10 years after the 2009 election. There was a uh, split support um, from the state level governance towards the competitors in Jakarta for the national level office, which I thought is really interesting that you have different representatives within the same party endorsing different um, out, out of the two major competitor, uh, competitors for national level office. Uh, the party chairman um, supported the opposition leader, uh, uh, Prabowo, while the secretary general um, supported Wadodo, the incumbent. Um, the incumbent actually won, um, won quite handily by 10%. 
um, the opposition leader uh, contested the result due to allegations of cheating, something you'll see in a lot of different areas in which you have the opposition group or the leader um, all allegating fraud. And that is also something that we've seen can escalate in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, uh, and Kenya and other cases to widespread violence. Um, so you have this uh, lack of clear consolidation and organization within the party structure as there's been a move towards uh, democracy. There's been also pressures for increased autonomy even beyond just um, uh, not, ne uh, not necessarily self-governments, but some more autonomy. Um, there's no uh, national level support in Jakarta for any kind of referendum like there was in East Timor for independence from Aceh. And it remains to be seen to what extent there is that kind of push towards uh, increased autonomy. As you saw in the videos, some people feel let down by the peace agreement in 2005. And there is challenges in relative inequality as well as resource rents that could also be motivations for, for ongoing instability. Um, and uh, the, the, the low-level cause in, in that uh, report, uh, talking about the referendum, that there was um, a call for a referendum as a way to kind of deal with the dissatisfaction for losing the election. So we'll see what actually happens and whether there is a, a, re a referendum going forward. But I'd be interested to hear your perspective trying to link a history of conflict as we've seen in a lot of states is often the best kind of precursor for whether there is going to be follow-on conflict. And the, the video um, from Al Jazeera showing how people fared in the decade after the peace agreement, do you think um, theoretically similar kind of causes of conflict exist now in, in Aceh that uh, could increase the risk of um, a civil war recurring um, going forward? So if you can take a break, log in to Waddle and respond to that question. I'd be interested to see your guys' thoughts and how we can link that one specific case to you have natural disasters leading to relative stability, but whether that long-term solution, other factors can also rear up to also cause problems. And then after that, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up with a couple of conclusions and links to the ongoing pandemic we're all living through.